Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Kristen Poor, curator at the Bernstein Gallery at the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our three speakers for today's conversation about Robertson Hall and its architect, Minoru Yamasaki. First, we will hear from David Jessen, principal at KPMB Toronto and the lead architect for the recent renovation of Robertson Hall, who will speak about that project. David has been a significant collaborator on many of KPMB's major cultural and academic commissions, including the transformation of Toronto's stock exchange into the design exchange. His projects also include the Ulysses Romo Rabinowitz building and Lewis A. Simpson International building in the former Frick Chemistry Lab at Princeton, which is located just across the plaza from Robertson Hall. After his presentation, David will be joined by design writer and editor Young No, and artist and writer Justin Beale for a conversation about Yamazaki's architecture and some of the broader questions posed by his work and legacy. Young No is a contributor to Architectural Digest, Wallpaper Magazine, uh, The Forum, and among other publications. Trained as an architect, he's also the author of several books on contemporary architecture and design, including the award-winning Bent Ply, which is a history of plywood furniture. He is the founder and editor-in-chief of the journal August and was the creative director and senior architecture editor at Rizzoli from 2006 to 2015. Justin Beale is a writer and curator as well as an artist with an extensive exhibition history. He graduated from Yale with a degree in architecture, and then he continued his studies at the Whitney Independent Study Program and at USC. His work is included in the permanent collections of the Albright Knox Museum, the Hammer Museum. Ah, oh, sorry, I was not appearing here. Hi, everyone. So apologies that you couldn't see me. Um, so, Justin, I was just telling you about where his collections are. He was at the Hammer Museum and the Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles. He is on the faculty at Hunter College. And this fall, MIT Press published his first book, Sand Future, which is about, among other things, Minoru Yamasaki. In the chat, I'll include links to the page for this event and for the Bernstein Gallery, where you can find more information about today's speakers and the exhibition currently on view at the gallery, which is a history of Robertson Hall from its commission in 1961 to its reopening this fall. We plan to have time for some audience questions at the end, so please feel free to submit your questions at any point during the event using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Finally, I'd like to thank Patty Yelovich, Lauren Mosco, and Bonalise Rosado for their work on this event. And now I'm thrilled to turn this over to David Jessen. Thank you, David. Thank you, Kristen. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Please tell me if you can see the first page visual. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs for inviting me to this conversation and, and probably mostly for affording KPMB the opportunity to actually, and privilege to actually work in and on a Yamasaki building. So uh, this was a very, very exciting project for us. Um, as Kristen mentioned, I'm going to be focusing my discussion on the actual renovation of Robertson Hall. And then we will uh, expand to the other panelists and we'll be talking a little more broader on Yamasaki himself. So the first thing I, whoop, did that advance? No, it's not. Hold on one second. There, you can see that now, the second slide. Okay, so um, Robertson Hall was completed in 1965, and it, it can really be interpreted as a modernist interpretation of an archetypal, archetypal temple. Uh, you know, a temple, a sacred place on the peak of a distant mountain, the star or the rising sun, and literally where Robertson Hall is placed 
It is sitting on the top of the crest of the hill of Washington Road where it meets Prospect Avenue. Um, it also opens up to which Yamasaki designed, the plaza to the north now known as Scuttered Plaza. So the whole building actually is, is, was viewed and, and seen totally in the round, much like a temple really is. The actual um, uh, sort of makeup, uh, like many temples, the, the, the structure of Robertson Hall is very, very simple and easily comprehended. It's two zones. Uh, the orange zone and the and the blue zone, which are actually three-story volumes, which are separated and linked by a central th thoroughfare or axis, and all of this is housed directly underneath what many people call the uh, the the cornice or the entablature. So it's a very very simple um, and direct um, sort of structure. As you can see here, the green zone is the entablature zone which all of the slender columns come up to support. The orange zone and the blue zone are the three story pieces on each side of this central um, light filled atrium that is the axis the, all the way through from the north to south side of the building. And these two yellow spaces on the top, when Yamasaki first designed the building, it was, those were open courts. Um, over subsequent renovations over many years, they ended up being enclosed. But you can see how very simple and direct the actual structure of the building is. It was uh, composed of concrete shear walls, which formed the two volumes on the north and south side of the central atrium, and then surrounded by these very slender tapered columns, which encloses the temple on all four sides. These 58 columns were manufactured in precast column and white quartz, and they were pre-manufactured and easily assembled on site very, very quickly. As you can see here, why the time we put on, or the time the, the upper floor or the entablature was established, the roof of the temple, it really became a modernist interpretation of such. And the level four is not just a cornice, it is an entablature. And what I find really interesting here is normally you will have, you'll have the, uh, the architrave, the frieze, and then you'll have the upper cornice. But the, in here, the, the scaling of it and the modernist, modernist interpretation of it is that the actual frieze portion of this building is occupied. What the surround of the colonnade did is it provided this elegant proportion of these tapered columns, which allowed for a beautiful play of light and shadow, creating delight and surprise as you walk around, walk around the building on all four sides. <clears throat> and the columns are an example of layering, a, a, a sort of a trait that Yamasaki used in, in this building and in many, many of his buildings. Um, and the modernist monumentality, monumentality of the travertine stone behind creates an elegant backdrop for, these, for, these, for the colonnade or for the columns to create a shadow that dances across the stone throughout the day. When the building was first built, um, it had on the west side a three, that one uh, sheer uh, concrete volume was a three story library with these suspended mezzanine floors. And at the top of that, because the entablature closed it off, this beautiful um, uh, lighting fixture, this, this, this opal sort of oculus was put in in order to bring light into the center of that, that volume. On the east side is the current Lewis Auditorium and the Schultz Dining Room. Again, three-story volumes that literally filled the block on, on, on each side of the central atrium. Now, the central atrium links actually all four spaces, all four floors together. There is the lower floor, level zero, as we call it. But the main, the main part of the temple was sitting on the mount, the top of the mount, and rose from there. This central atrium is light filled. It has beautiful detailing with the sort of elegant and curved columns, the slender use of the original framing to support all the glazing. And it just created a sort of um, uh, uh, monumental, but very sophisticated central zone that linked the entire building together. 
And of course, what it does do is it supports the upper skylight, which is a double layered skylight, all shaped and fasted, so that as you look up from the ground all the way up to the sky, you look through all of the layers that Yamasaki brought into this building through the delicate sort of, uh, of trellis work on level four and the combination of the solid walls on the ground floor. And as you rose in the building and looked up in the building, everything became lighter and a little more fragile. Even the uh, sort of detailing of materials, the very, very simple material palette of wood and stone and glass and metal it ranges from very monolithic use of, of, of solid walls to delicate, almost like tracery or veil-like details in the glazing, the wood paneling for acoustic partitions, and even the plaster and uh, wood trellis, which surrounds the guard on level four. This, this sort of delicate tracery or delicate sort of use of, of, of juxtaposition of fine tuned details against the, uh, the solid backdrop is found in all of the very slender curved handrails, which are actually juxtaposed as you look, go through the building, you see the layering of the, uh, the trellis on the fourth floor beyond. It just seems to be this, that the light is filtering through many, many layers as you go through the building. At one point, uh, I believe it was in uh, 2002, the open floor plate of the areas in the three-story um, library were closed in. They just needed program space. And all of these sort of new infill floor plates were hung by um, steel, steel posts or, or hangers that are all supported from the, the waffle slab, which is the floor of the entablature above. What happened was when they enclosed these rooms, the spaces became very narrow, the corridors were very narrow, and the sort of blockage of light to the exterior or bringing any sort of natural light into the building just tended to get closed off. And even in the original design on level four, you can see here that even though the central atrium had a lot of light filled in the in the in where the skylight was. The corridors were very narrow. The, the rooms were all closed off, and even here, where the light does filter in, it it hit solid walls, which which separated the atrium from the rest of the building. So even though it was a linkage, it it it's separated the two sort of monumental forms on each side of the central atrium. And those original outdoor courts that existed on level four were at one point enclosed um, to be again needing program space. A roof was put on top of them and a skylight was put here. So again, the, the light really, the natural light from outside didn't really filter in that far into this space. And as you can see here, the courts themselves were closed off with solid walls at each end, mostly for acoustic reasons. So the, the problem was, is that um, the sort of interior use of the space, even though you had all of this beautiful light filled spaces outside around the building and in the central area, nothing was happening within the space itself and everything was starting to get closed off from one another. So the project goal here was to reorganize the space within Robertson Hall to create a highly collaborative and flexible work environment with sustainability and, and emphasize individual and collective identity while responding to the unique architectural heritage of Yamasaki. So we emphasized and celebrated Yamasaki's original design attributes, which were light, transparency, layering um, of delicate veils. So here, we even looked at sort of the original details and shapes of his slender columns and his fine, his fine sort of um, slender use of the, uh, the glazing framing and introduced it even into design motifs for the signage or, or any sort of um, 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 markers that we put across glass. So we tried to bring a lot of the original details into anything we introduced, such as the curved walls of the auditorium on, on the main floor 
and all of the sort of rounded edges that we see in all of all of the tapered columns. We even brought it to something as simple as the custom washroom sinks that were put in. So we started with the entrance into the building. The original um, building on the left here, when it was first built, th they didn't do vestibules back then. So there was really no sort of thermal protection from the inside to the outside. And the revolving door was, was, was very small in scale. And it didn't really reflect the sort of users or the, the types of users that the university um, accommodates today. So what we did is we rebuilt the vestibule. We took away the two separate side doors and the small revolving door and made it one larger vestibule that became more of a communal space that everybody could use. And we used rounded corners, picking up again on a lot of the detailing that uh, Yamasaki's original building had. This new vestibule slips within the original for glazing framing of the building itself. So we maintained the overall scale and it's still pr well protected underneath the colonnade and the, uh, the cornice outside. The overall lobby we restored to its sort of original majestic monumental um, feel, the very serene um, use of the, the, the materials that were, were the, the walnut was refurnished. We polished up all of the marble. Uh, we replaced the carpet to something that was a little more, uh, actually the pattern, a little more reminiscent of some of the curves that Yamasaki has used throughout the building. To the north, or sorry, to the east was the uh, Lewis, is the Lewis Auditorium. Uh, we did a, just another sort of renovation or restoration of those spaces. We refinished all of the wood panels and the desking that was in the space, uh, introduced new AV and lighting within the original ceiling. And we actually introduced a new rear entrance into the auditorium from the back, which never existed before. And to augment accessibility, using again, very, very thin metal, reminiscent of a lot of the details that Rob Yamasaki had used as well. We introduced not only step lights, but small handrails along all of the aisles. Thermal comfort. So some of the sustainability issues that we were dealing with, um, Back then, when the, when the building was first built, it was, con it was uh, concrete slabs with very little insulation on them. We needed to improve that. So here you can see on the left, the waffle slab, which is basically the floor of the entablature that all of the other spaces are hung from. We introduced new thermal insulation spray on this. And I have to admit, the day that this was put in and we walked on these floors, with the curtain and the mist, uh, it actually felt like uh, I was walking in the heavens, I was walking in the cloud. It, it, it was a beautiful experience. Um, the original partitions, there was acoustic issues in the building. They were just thin little trellis-like studs. Uh, we beefed that up to stronger double layered studs. And as you can see, increased the insulation between rooms. And structural modifications, there were not a lot, but as I, as I mentioned earlier, the library had floors that were suspended within the space and they were all suspended from the upper slab by these slender hangers. But some of those hangers fell when it was, when it was library stacks, it didn't really matter. But these, hang, these hangers fell in areas where we needed to have program and they were, in, they were interfering. But the nice thing about the library on the west side is that they were hung slabs. So there was a natural gap between the slab and the perimeter wall, which allowed us to transfer the loads over and introduce new hangers that slipped down that gap to support the floors below and allowed us to have an open floor plate. So light and air. All of the, uh, what was very important to us and what was also very beautiful about the original, uh, the building is the ability for light to come into the space, not only through the central atrium, but also through the ribbon of windows and the ribbon of fenestration that, that, that existed in the surrounding travertine walls and this beautiful sort of pattern of windows within the, with, with, within the upper freeze area. We had to improve the acoustic, or sorry, the, the thermal um, performance of the building. So we replaced all of the single glazing with IGU units. So we had thermal, uh, and, and thermal improvement to the glazing itself. 
But the beautiful thing, thing was, is we fit it all within the existing original slender framing of the building itself. So from the outside and using the, the same um, glazing, gray, gray tint to the glazing, from the outside of the building, you don't even know that the, that the windows have changed. On levels two and three, we introduced operable windows, again, with the zero sight lines. So from the outside, you don't even know they're, they're there. But now with the new sustainability measures, we brought natural ventilation into the building. And on level four, we actually managed to uh, custom make the windows to fit the exact same profile of the original window shapes that were on the uh, in, in the freeze level. And as you can see here, they now are operable every fourth window. But again, from the outside, the, the overall um, appearance of the building is exactly the same. So the interventions for the renovation are really quite simple, but really quite striking. And I think that's what Yamasaki's building was all about as well. We wanted to open up all of the floor plates. We want to open up all of the floor plates, re reconnect to the, I'm sorry, here we go. Open up all of the floor plates, reconnect to visible or to the exterior to be able to bring natural light in. And rather than have enclosed rooms around enclosed rooms, create sort of open communal spaces on every single floor, similar to almost what the courts were doing originally on level four. So um, corridors were opened up to views to bring the natural light in. We introduced curved um, sort of geometry to all of the rooms around the circulation routes in order to promote an ease circulation. And we widened all of the corridors so that they became places where people can commune or people can get together. They were no longer just a destination. Uh, as you can see here, as I said, sort of the rounded details brought in. We also introduced or, or stayed with a very, very simple material palette as Yamasaki's original building had. And we introduced or expanded on the use of terrazzo. Terrazzo used to be um, sort of in details around the perimeter floor of, of the perimeter of level four, um, but we now introduce it as a, as a flooring material on all of the lower levels or levels one, two, and three. And within the central space of level one, rather than being in closed rooms, it became a communal court for people to use, for students to gather and direct connectivity to any of the program spaces around it through gla glass walls. On level two, the same approach was taken. Here you can see the widened corridor, the, the brighter material palette, the connection to the exterior, but we introduced a sort of a multifunctional um, programs on these floors where these are sliding doors that open up to become not only storage area, but also a servery so that the corridors became less about circulation and more about opportunity for people to get together. The corridors leading to offices, all of the office fronts were glazed. So again, bringing the light from the outside into the center of the uh, office plate. Level three is similar again, the widened corridor connection to the, to the exterior. But here the central court became the largest of, of the lower levels here. And so there's your, there's your overall north-south corridor. What we introduced here was a central living room. The entire uh, central floor plate of this is a communal space. And similar to some of the, uh, the slender wood battens that Yamasaki used in Lewis Auditorium, we encased this area with, with partial screen walls, which actually um, uh, concealed some of the original hangers used to support these floor plates. Offices looked out to the central space and it, it became this sort of trellised or screened um, space where everyone comes together within uh, in the middle of the floor plate. Now, level four was, as you saw earlier, where the, the atrium, where the light came into the atrium, it was somewhat focused, the natural light was focused just around the atrium itself because the perimeter walls around the atrium were all solid and closed off due to fire code reasons. And what we mean by that is, even though the light filters in and creates these beautiful shadows in the main space, 
because this atrium, which was which is an open wood and plaster trellis, connected down to three floors, you couldn't allow, you couldn't connect more than floor floors together. So all of the surrounding walls were either rated solid walls or fire doors. So that meant that all of the light coming into this space really didn't have, wasn't afforded the opportunity to filtrate into the actual floor space itself. So what we did is in order to celebrate the overall trellis and the atrium, we took away the small railing and we encased the, the overall atrium or, or trellis with fire rated glass. And what that allowed us to do is bring the natural light into the overall floor plate, open up all of the walls and all of the spaces that look, that look into this central space. So they become inviting and glass filled and light filled corridors, seating areas, or even the surrounding meeting rooms that look into this space are now filtering the natural light from outside through the meeting room walls and into, into the center atrium itself. And here's a view just of the, of the meeting room itself, looking back into this central space. The whole idea of bringing light in, the glass office fronts on, on the lower levels were also introduced on level four. And any corridor now had a destination to a public or communal space at the end so that no one had afforded the, the, the uh, no one could have the ability of sort of the, the master of the corner. Everything became more communal and more collaborative. The central atrium is directly opposite on, on the south side, directly opposite the central lounge uh, for this floor as well, which again, with glass fronts, a layering from the internal to the external and vice versa, and vice versa allows the spaces to connect to one another and the light filters in from one space to another. Those open courts that I first said were open courtyards on the roof and then were enclosed. We took away the solid walls at each end, introduced curves in the ceiling and in the walls to promote circulation through these spaces again. We needed to keep them enclosed because we needed the program space but now they became part of, as I said, the circulation route, they became spaces where everyone could walk through and enjoy them. And <clears throat> we introduced the veiling or the layering with an acrylic veil around the upper sort of clear story so that the light that filtered into the space was softened. And I really love one of the, this uh, sort of heritage picture, a uh, picture of one of the offices or meeting rooms on level four. We try to promote that in the use of these communal spaces on level four. All of the corners are meeting rooms that everyone is, is invited to share and beautiful, beautiful view of the campus from, from all sides. On level zero, um, the, the gray area here is, it was really sort of a facelift in many respects. Um, this this uh, area had been expanded on the south and on the west. Uh, in 2002, we, what we did is we um, upgraded the finishes a little bit to, um, to filter in or to, to expand on the overall palette, the original palette that Yamasaki used for color. And wherever skylights existed on this floor, we made them, them open up onto communal spaces. Again, trying to bring that filtering of light all the way down to the lower level, which the renovation in 2002 opened up the west side. So even the Bernstein Gallery has a beautiful natural, um, uh, has natural light filtering air into it from one end. So the uh, Robertson Hall is still a temple, uh, but it's open, it's light filled, it's airy, uh, it's sustainable. And what's really beautiful about it now is, is that not only is it um, usable by, by, sorry, uh, more usable by the users of the building itself, it's open to the campus and it's, it's, it's globally welcoming to, to everyone. And that is Robertson Hall. Uh, Great, thank you so much, David. I don't know, Kristen, if you wanna jump in at this point or if I should just roll. Um, it looks, it's really magnificent, David. I was at Princeton a couple of weeks ago and managed to sneak around the bottom 
floors, but I didn't make it up to the fourth floor, which looks so beautiful. I'm, 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 I hope to go back soon with the required permissions. Um, I also really loved your description uh, of, it occurred to me looking at, the, at your description of the freeze on the fourth floor, the idea of, of those being windows and, and the thought that had never occurred to me before of the people who were occupying those windows essentially being the characters within the kind of traditional freeze, um, I think is a really nice idea. I, um, I thought I would just quickly run through a couple of slides that I thought might help to put this project in context. And then, uh, then I think we should just jump into a discussion. Um, I don't know, am I, um, okay, it looks like I'm able to share my screen here. So I just wanna quickly, um, I was just gonna run through these real quick. This is Minoru Yamasaki. Um, it's always nice to start with a photo. And I just add, a, you know, this, I think what's interesting about this project in the context of Yama's career is it, it it's really happens at a point when he's kind of approaching the sort of the, the height of his, his influence and his sort of talent really in, in his career. And that was a, that was a process that began with this project in St. Louis, which was completed in 1954, which is the Lambert uh, Municipal Airport. And this was sort of the first really experimental use of stressed concrete in his practice. It was also the first project that was really celebrated on a national level. And shortly after he finished the airport, he had an operation which, um, after which his doctors recommended that he take some time off. Uh, that led to an extensive trip through uh, Asia and Europe. And, and he came back from that trip with a kind of new sense of what he was trying to do architecturally and, I, and, and articulated that in two articles uh, in architectural record. But the, the, essentially the idea was that Yamasaki considered modernism to be a great project, but an incomplete project. And that while it was structurally incredibly compelling, it lacked this uh, attention to the human occupant. And so after he sort of articulated that idea, he, he built it into two projects that were sort of the first two projects that really defined his mature style. The first was the Reynolds Metal Building, uh, which you see here. And the second was the McGregor Conference Center on Wayne State University campus in Detroit. I think this building in particular has a lot of the formal elements that kind of come to maturity in the Robertson building. I mean, you can see from here that, the, as David so clearly explained at the beginning, the two rectangles with this kind of central atrium. Um, I think in a lot of ways that program is far more resolved in Robertson, but you can see kind of the early stages of it here. Um, another project that I think is significant is the Dharan Airport in Saudi Arabia, uh, which was a which was one of the first instances of Yamasaki directly bringing sort of more uh, Islamic influences into the facade. You can start to see this elongating that I, I think in a certain way is an antecedent to what happens in Robertson. And then also this um, science pavilion for the World's Fair in Seattle, which is significant mostly in the, in the context of his career because it was, this was basically the job this is a longer story, but this is essentially the job that got him the commission to design the World Trade Center. Um, it also, and the, 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 the then when he won that commission, there was this article about him on the cover of Time Magazine, which was kind of a, a high point of sorts of, of his career. But I, what, what's particularly interesting to me about Robertson, to bring it back to this building, is the is the you know, this is, this is a project that was commissioned right before he won the commission to design the World Trade Center, but it was completed well before the World Trade Center was completed. And so it was kind of happening at this apex of his career, but before he did the project for which he's now the best known. And, and I think it was also kind of a moment when he had gone off on this new direction in his practice that was generally greeted by the publicly, by the public very favorably and was, critically not so favorably received. And this building I think was a real um, quandary because a lot of people were, were struggling to kind of figure out what it meant. And, and it was, it, it's 
that's interesting in particular because it, it also connects to two other projects, uh, particularly the, the image on the right, which is the uh, Northwestern National Life Building in Minneapolis, which, which happened just before Robertson. And you can clearly see the connection between those two buildings. And then the Mutual of Omaha office in Miami, where you see that um, slightly more awkwardly articulated entablature on, on the top. Um, and then of course there are bits of this stretch move that happens in all three of those buildings that's, that's come to bear on the lower facade of, of the World Trade Center. Um, and that was really just, I just wanted to kind of quickly run through those to just show some images of what else was happening around the same time. And, um, and then the other thing that I, was, that I was thinking about this morning as I was reading a, a bit in preparation for this talk was about Yama's relationship to Ada Louise Huxtable, who was a great supporter of his work early on, a great supporter of the Trade Center design early on, and then who kind of changed her opinion later in the stages of the World Trade Center project. And it's actually interesting, one of the first, probably the first article in the New York Times where she starts to question what's going on is a, a piece called Pools, Domes, Yamasaki Debate, where she talks both about McGregor and Robertson, not about the World Trade Center, but just sort of positioning it as this moment. She's talk, she talks about this great critical debate about Yamasaki's work that the world is having, but it really seems like the debate is happening within her own head about what she thinks. And I think this is a building she was looking at a lot at that time, and she, she liked it, but also I think was um, unsure of where his practice was going. But um, I think we can just jump into a discussion there because I don't want to, I don't want to, I, I want to, don't want to stray too far from what David was talking about either. Um, so that's, that, that's my bit. And I don't know, Young, maybe if you want to jump in now. And, and I, yeah, I have questions all along the presentation. Right. And first of all, I want to add my congratulations to David and his office for a really pretty incredible restoration and renovation of Robertson Hall. Um, you made it better. And I think if, uh, I would like to think that if Yamasaki had the ch chance to actually do the renovation himself, he probably would go along the very same lines of bringing more light in, making the building lighter and more porous. And that's, that porosity is what actually, why I want to turn up the thread, I want to pull on a bit. Um, you know, I, I spent a couple of years in Princeton in the office of Michael Graves down the street. So I know the campus a little bit. And the first time I saw Robertson Hall, um, I thought that it was a very odd building, for sure. This was some 20 odd years ago. And um, <clears throat> for me, it, 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 it spoke in a very um, foreign accent, if that's the right term. And maybe that's the right um, sort of analogy because it is, um, it's a very prominent building. It's an, object building, a temple versus a context building within that campus. It takes many cues from the campus. It obviously has this um, Grecian language that you spoke about transposing sort of the idea of the, the temple and the temperature and so forth into a modern building. But there's a few other things about it that I thought was not Greek or Roman or within that language. And um, that's the one that actually I want to have the discussion uh, uh, right now. Um, you know, Yamasaki was carrying multiple heritages with him as he was doing uh, these buildings. And Justin, in the book, you mentioned that when he was just out of school, he did visit Europe for the first time. He saw yeah. a number of buildings that he yeah. didn't he was not impressed with, but the most, uh, the one that had the most impression on him was a Gothic cathedral, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, the Gothic was always a, a strong influence for sure, yeah. Yeah, and so it was, it's, it's the thinness, lightness, and the idea of, of exposed structuralism that I think that he started to carry through. And so the layering and the kind of idea of the, the tracery or the lacing within the building um, David, as you were describing it, spoke to me more about this idea of a Gothic um, language rather than a Roman language. And, um, and then there's also, you know, I think that 
um, being probably the first prominent Asian architect in America, he probably felt that particular heritage as well. Um, Justin, do you see any of that? Do you feel that there was some connection in terms of what he's trying to do here at a school appropriately for international affairs? Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting way of posing it in terms of thinking about the internationality of it. I mean, I think that this would have been a time in his career when he was thinking a lot about um, these sort of compressed spaces opening into open spaces, right? These changes in context. I thought of that, you know, when I was there recently, kind of as you come up from the zero floor up into that atrium, the kind of opening, and then the idea of these additional open spaces that also kind of reopen. Um, so, you know, I think there was, there, there's a point, this is a time in his career when you can sort of see these influence, like a whole storm of influences kind of activating in his brain. Um, and, so, and I think there's definitely, the, there's kind of an awkwardness, but a kind of intriguing awkwardness to this Gothic meets Greek temple right. combo. Um, I mean, I actually, it's actually really what I love about the building. I think it has this, um, there's kind of almost this kind of humor to it in the context of, a, of such a Gothic campus, right? And that this sort of this idea of that, that you kind of go through all of this Gothic, which is really kind of, a, it's not truly Gothic, it's sort of a pastiche, a college Gothic. And then you kind of arrive at this thing that is both a temple and has these Gothic kind of proportions. Um, I, I mean, I always thought that that was something sort of wonderful I, for a building that's so often criticized as being out of place. I thought, right. it was kind of, I think of it as kind of being wonderfully appropriately placed, right? Absolutely, yeah. right. Trying to pull in the, a certain kind of context into, into yeah. a building that, that may, not, may not read that way. Um, I think what saves the building from being pastiche Gothic is the structure, you know, the way it's sort of built together. So that was very intrigued, David, when you were talking about, and I, I'm not sure I understand this. I'd love to get your explanation. You said that um, the entablature space, the, the rooms that sort of overhang where the, the thin columns on top of the thin columns are actually hung in some way. Is that correct? Yes. So, um... <clears throat> As I was describing, the three-story volumes that are basically underneath the entablature on each side, right? The library space on the west side was a three-story volume, um, but the, the mezzanines for all of the book stacks were literally hung mezzanines, and they were they were hung from you know steel hangers that were all attached to the underside of the coffered slab of the entablature. So like so what happens is the three-story volumes on each side were, were concrete shear walls that went all the way up. And everything other than the roof that sat on it or the entablature that sat on it, anything else within the space is literally hanging within there. Mm. So it's almost like you, you could take it away and bring something else in. Or um, it, it, it's quite beautiful in that respect. And, and as, I, as I mentioned earlier, it had afforded us some really easy structural modifications that if they weren't just hanging slabs, we would have had to have gotten to a lot more expense to, to open up the floor space, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's quite beautiful, um, sort of structurally and fundamentally, conceptually that way, that um, as, as I, I mentioned earlier, you understand, or as an architect, but I think anyone understands what this building is as soon as you see it. Um, which, which, is, which is quite beautiful. Right. So two, two uh, follow-up questions, David. Um, mm -hmm. Did you have any structurally, or when you were doing the, re the renovation, did you run into any structural problems that stood in the way of opening up the building more? Or was it, do you just happen to believe that the structure is the structure and you work around that? So it was really about opening up the building to suit the, the new program requirements, right? So previously, when you had these little hangers coming down, that's because it was small rooms. And now we needed the rooms to be bigger. We needed to accommodate larger groupings of people together. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't do that if you had a structural hanger and coming down in the middle of the space, right? So, so in essence, um, 
structurally the the overall sort of overall concept of the building we did not change but it allowed us because of the sort of insertions that this building allows you to do it it eased the ability to open up the floor space by making these minor structural modifications mm. um i want to go back to justin uh, for the next question. But before that, I just want to mention to everyone who's listening to this talk that um, in about five or seven minutes, we, we will open it up for Q&A and you can just type into the chat box any questions you might have either for David or Justin, and I'll pass it on to it. But Justin, you know, just going back to the this sort of structural innovation, and maybe this is a question for David too, um, at the World Trade Center, in order to get the height that the building achieved, um, Yamasaki has to um, achieve a couple of structural tricks. And I just want you to quickly go through that and see if there's some parallel with Robertson and what we just discussed. Yeah, I mean, uh, two thoughts come immediately to mind. I mean, you know, what you're talking about with the World Trade Center was of course that in order to get as high as they wanted to build the World Trade Center, they did these two tricks. The one was stacking the elevators, which is now a more common practice of having an express elevator and a lower uh, and a local elevator, which allowed for more rentable space on each floor. And the second was allowing the exterior wall to do more of the load bearing, whereas a traditional skyscraper would be supported almost entirely from the core. Um, you know, what, what that makes me think of not specifically is those changes so much as the way in which he, Yamasaki really was, I think his core strength was, uh, his core confidence was as an engineer, he really had an engineer's mind. And he was always thinking about engineering. I think that's kind of lost in the narrative about him. And he was also really experimenting kind of on the job. And what's so interesting about this building to me is the way you can see he's like, he's, there are ideas that existed in McGregor and in Reynolds and in Northwestern that are sort of wonderfully come to maturity in this building. And I think that the proportions work really nicely. And this idea of using um, these incredibly sculptural columns, but they're also columns that can be prefabricated off site, popped into place. It's quite a modern way of thinking about construction, right? That, that you know, it, they, they're, they're both ornate and also incredibly practical because they're not marble, they're cast concrete and they just plug and play and they go right in into into place and i think that that um you can kind of always see how one project is leading to the next one it's actually funny david you showed that beautiful uh, and i think the materiality of this building is also something that is hard sometimes to appreciate in photographs but it, extraordinary material use of material and i think the way you've picked up on that is, is really um makes tons of sense but the, you know, it's the, everything is done in this really kind of exquisite material. And I love that image of the um, stair railing because you start to see in that stainless stair railing the same thought process that was going into making the facade of the World Trade Center, that same kind of curve, it's all right in that railing. And it'd be interesting to kind of go back and look at those um, in terms of when they happened time-wise, but I wouldn't be right. surprised if they were concurrent. Well, um, it's funny, Justin, I'm just going to say that when we were looking at the building, and of course, the stairs at Robertson are absolutely stunning. They're like little pieces of jewelry. And as soon as I saw the railings, do you know that the World Trade Center jumped into my mind right away? And I thought, right hey, there. Yeah, know, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> projects grow from other projects. <laughs> yeah. Do you both feel that this is the one aspect um, for about Yamasaki for me of the limited number of buildings I've seen is that his circulation and especially vertical circulation doesn't work that well. Is that, I feel like there's a little bit of that here at Robertson as you were describing it, David, do you felt that way? And do you well, try to fix that? Well, yes, what, what's really interesting is again, because it was really, to me, this building was about two big blocks that support an upper floor. Um, all of the sort of vertical circulation is hidden away. Yeah. Um, in fact, we had to open up the stairwells, which, which we did. They were behind shear walls and we opened them up and put rated glass in so people could see the stairs and promote the use of it. But it was almost like it, uh, the building was obsessed with the overall form of the building and not how people actually use it. 
And I think, for example, when you get to the, the, the level four, which was, uh, which is what I was trying to, to mention is like, you have this beautiful atrium with this gorgeous uh, skylight above it, bringing all this light into it. And the light was trapped. Mm. It couldn't go anywhere. It didn't go deeper into the floor plate. And it's almost like the sort of partee of the building overtook how you use the building. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that, that image was really striking um, of just the, you know, the flat wall just kind of facing those right windows for sure. Although they were great for art. <laughs> right. I saw I saw a big, beautiful Bertoia. Are there any other pieces of art that was original in the building? So the, the Bertoia of the world was original and it was kept as well. Yeah. Um, that's really the only other piece. Other pieces have come in over the time, but that was the original piece when Yamasaki built the building. That Got was. It. So there, there were no plans for any kind of uh, murals or tapestries for the two walls on the two sides of the, the Great Hall? No, in fact, uh, it was a very serene you know, a very calm, serene space. And it was really about the volume of the walls and the then the, the architecture, the detailing of the architecture. And the Pretoria was the only sort of piece of art brought in. Of course, with, with the Knoll furniture beautifully arranged and symmetrically arranged around it, right? <laughs> Do you know? I actually who... showed, I, I, we're talking this very short little anecdote. I sent Kristen this uh, photo of the, of Yamasaki's house in Bloomfield Hills in 1972. And he has the, what I assume to be the prototype of that sculpture, a much smaller little Bertoia world in his living room. So there's this nice connection between his living room and that. Mm. Interesting. Which brings up the first question we have from, um, from a viewer, uh, Laurie Murray McKinney asks, um, David, can you talk mm. about the exterior the plaza and the integration of the temple with the plaza and the fountain sculpture. So this idea of inside outside and the view out. Right, so, <clears throat> is a, uh, so the plaza which Yamasaki designed, it has been redesigned and reshaped over the years, but the whole plaza there uh, built to the north side of it, one created a very large monumental space connected directly to the building itself and really emphasized this sort of building, this temple in the round. But what it also did was it, it took, um, it's the connection of the interior to the exterior and the sort of direct relationship of the, the, the axial alignment of the atrium itself that comes directly out onto this plaza, which is at the crossroads of of a major area within campus itself, just kind of placed this, this building, which is all about, um, you know, uh, getting people together. It's like, it's like the forum, it's the temple, it's promoting um, democratized sort of, uh, uh, you know, gatherings. It, 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 it provided the sort of central campus space right connected directly to this building, all in the same place. So, um, I don't think you could, I don't think Yamasaki would have placed this building on campus if he didn't have that sort of exterior grounding that he created for it to sit on. Well, one of the amazing images that Kristen dug up is that the extraordinary lengths to which they went to move the, the building, the other building with the name of which I've forgotten to, to accommodate that space. So, you know, it, they, this giant structure had to be moved to create that negative space too, which right. uh, which makes it feel that much more intentional. And right, that was uh, Corwin Hall that got yeah. moved on the railway right. on the railroad yeah. tracks. And given the nature of what goes inside, who speaks inside that building, sometimes um, it's a the the plaza is a great space for gatherings and protests, of which yeah. there are some great images of of that Kristen has stuck up as well. True. Sure. Um, we have another question from Paul Kader, who's the author of y the Yamasaki monograph. Um, you have taken a wonderful sensitive approach to this project. A small question, did I correctly notice that the interlocking ring pattern from the Reynolds building is used in the rug in the atrium? I assume that's intentional. Actually, it was the, the pattern in the rug was actually taken from the Robertson Hall itself. 
and looking at the sort of the all of the curves, all of the sort of um, detailing that was used on the tapered columns, the the upper windows, and it was it started out as a sort of a collage, an ordered collage, and that's where we came up with that pattern. After the fact, we realized that there were some associations with other patterns and other buildings around, but it was not the direct inspiration. Mm, interesting. Mm. Um, Deborah here says, my father was a bricklayer and mason who worked on this building in the early 60s. He still talks about it. He said that there was another building in this location which has to be moved in order to construct this building. We just mentioned that. Uh, he also said that every one of his buildings were a shrine to Yamasaki. <laughs> <laughs> Justin, how do you feel about that? I mean, I, I think um, Yamasaki would be is, is rolling in his grave at the sound of that. I think that's not how he intended it at all. Um, but there, you know, there's an undeniable grandeur to the result in this mm. case. So mm. he was a very um, modest man, if that's the right word. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, just to bring back my, my original question, do either of you guys see any of his Asian, Japanese sort of um, influence in, in this building and some of his other buildings, or is that something I'm making up? David? I, I can't say that I directly see it. Um, I, the only thing I could say is that this is a modernist building and modernist sort of, you know, interpretation of a temple. And I don't want to put too much emphasis on the temple, even though I have. But I think because of some of the sort of very delicate um, detailing that, has that he has used, it could be that that's where maybe some of those, those thoughts and those, those um, ambitions are coming across into this building. Mm. I mean, Young, you've asked that question now twice, so I'm curious if you have a take on it. Um, I mean, I, you know, I think it's, yeah, go ahead. No, I, I you know, I'm, I'm just putting it in a certain context. I mean, I am Asian, as you can see. I, um, you know, at the time, I believe on you know, the trip that you mentioned that he, he went on after the surgery, he went to India and he saw the um, American embassy in Delhi by mm -hmm. um, Edward Durrell Stone. Edward Durrell Stone, which, yeah. you know, is using a certain kind of local language there, right? And it had a kind of a great influence on him. Um, and then, you know, I when I work with Ian Pei on his monograph, there were we talked about a certain slenderness of the column, making them as, as thin as possible so that there's kind of porosity and a, an openness to it. So this is my personal reading for sure, but I just wanted to throw it out there. No, I mean, I think it's definitely there. I I, I think what I I'm reluctant to say that I, I, I see a Japanese influence specifically architecturally, but it, you know this is a time in his career where he's very much thinking about the, what the ways in which um, traditional Japanese architecture is addressing the needs of the kind of occupant of the building in a way that a sort of Western conception of modernism is not, mm -hmm. uh, and you know that this is a, and that's the the route through which a lot of features have become standard, the water feature, the kind of enclosed courtyard uh, begin to enter his work. And so I think there, there are certainly parts of it. And, and the sort of what's wonderful about this trip, even though it happened seven years before this project began, is that you see this kind of blending of, of Gothic structure and verticality of uh, Islamic decoration and layering, and uh, you know, and traditional Japanese um, use of natural lighting and like water features, right? It all starting to blend, and so it does get kind of confused um, or complex. Complex, right? Especially when he's then kind of layering all of that on top of this much this more traditionally modernist structure. Right. Um, you know, and, and so I think it all, a lot of those things kind of are coming to bear on it. And this is a case, this building is a case where you see elements of all of that, um, which I think is also why people critically had some issues with it. Cause they're like, what is this? Mm -hmm. uh, right. 
Well, I think that's a great note to end this discussion. I think after 60 something years, the building is still rich enough, layer enough, and obviously complex enough for us to have a fairly lively discussion and probably go, could go on for another couple of hours and not get to any resolution. But um, David, again, thank you. And congratulations on a very beautiful, very sensitive uh, restoration and renovation of the building. Thank and you very much. Congratulations yeah. on your great book. And congratulations and to Kristen on you. her beautiful show that nobody outside of the institution will be able to see, <laughs> but you'll just have to take our word for it. Which uh, is on view through January 7th for those excellent. who are on campus. Um, Justin, David, Young, thank you so much for this um, really fascinating conversation and for highlighting the complexity of Yamasaki's work and this building. Um, this concludes this event. Thank you all. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much.